In today's world, becoming internet famous is a dream come true for many, and hell, some would happily accept being made into a living meme if it meant they got an ounce of popularity out of it. Yes, it's true that sometimes becoming attached to a meme has its benefits. There are countless stories of individuals becoming online celebrities thanks to quirky viral video appearances or one-off gimmicks blowing up on sites like TikTok. And sometimes these one-off viral hits can become monetarily lucrative. But while living memehood has worked out for some, for others, their abrupt run-in with online celebrity proved to have life-ruining consequences. From a living meme suing its creator for monetary damages, to a woman's career destroyed by a fake viral story, to a teenager being implicated as a deranged psychopath, these are the cases where internet memes ruined lives. Today's video is sponsored by Keeps, and to begin the ad, let's look at my hair from old videos back in 2020. Yeah, as you can see, I was losing hair and losing it fast. I didn't feel like going bald, so I decided to do something about my hair loss and started getting treatments through Keeps. And to be honest, the results have been pretty insane. Here's me at six months after starting treatments, a year after starting treatments, two years after starting treatments, and me right now, almost two and a half years later, and your boy's looking pretty good. Keeps offers generic versions of the two FDA-approved hair loss products at a can't-beat price. And best of all, you skip the trip to the doctor's office and pharmacy. Keeps will set you up with a prescribing medical provider online and then ship your prescription right to your front door. And in four to six months, you should start seeing results. Look, I stand by Keeps. I've been taking the stuff for years now. It works. And if you're a guy that's having some anxiety about hair loss, there's no better time than now to start. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash wavy or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash wavy. For most individuals that become living memes thanks to a viral video, the living meme is always a bit at fault for the creation of the meme itself. As almost every viral video either originates from a public setting or was a piece of content the would-be living meme actively chose to put out into the world. However, there are a few cases out there where an individual was essentially forced into memehood after bad faith actors leaked private videos to the internet. Which of course brings us to the age-old story of the Star Wars kid. In April of 2003, well before the advent of YouTube, a video called Jackass underscore Star Wars underscore funny dot WMV was uploaded to a popular peer-to-peer -peer file sharing website known as Kazaa. This video features a portly teenager wielding a metallic looking rod, who was apparently attempting to mimic Darth Maul's lightsaber choreography from Star Wars The Phantom Menace. The video is notable for a variety of reasons, but what you need to know is that this was intended to be a private recording never to be shared or seen by anyone else. <laughs> The creator and star of this video was a 14-year-old from Quebec, Canada named Ghislaine Raza. In late 2002, Ghislaine had filmed the video using a camcorder loaned out from his school, the scene being recorded to an 8mm cassette tape. So how does this embarrassing video make its way to the internet? Enter Ghislaine's classmate Jerome Laflamme. Jerome would stumble upon this botched lightsaber choreography after Ghislaine had mistakenly left the cassette recording at school along with that shared camcorder. Apparently Ghislaine had forgotten to remove or delete this footage and it was still just sitting on this camera that other classmates used. Finding the cassette's contents cringeworthy, Jerome and two of his other friends come up with an idea. They would upload Ghislaine's lightsaber video to the internet in an effort to prank and humiliate their classmate. In regard to why he uploaded the video, Jerome has been quoted as saying, I thought it'd be an interesting prank. I wanted Ghislaine to know what I knew of him, what I had seen. All I did was take the cassette, digitize it on the studio computer to pull a joke on Ghislaine. After that, I had nothing to do with it. And with that said, no one could have ever predicted just how viral this video would become. 
Upon viewing this video, many believe the flailing teenager featured in it to be someone who actually thought they were performing impressive choreography. And of course, most believe that it was the kid who uploaded this video to the internet in the first place. I mean, after all, how does a video get online without you uploading it, right? Under these assumptions, it becomes pretty reasonable to make fun of the guy, and hundreds of thousands would do exactly that. In a 2003 pre-YouTube internet, the video was shared to message boards, indie video sites, and through email. And Raza's video was one of the internet's first truly viral video memes, literally spreading by word of mouth, no algorithms involved. This thing was all natty. Within two weeks, meme edits of the footage had been created by internet jokesters, and many more would follow, warping Ghislaine's original recording in seemingly unlimited ways. Internet blogger Andy Bio would mirror the file to his own website, waxy.org, under the name StarWarsKid.WMV. Here it would receive over 1.1 million downloads, and because of the name he assigned to it, Star Wars Kid sort of became the unofficial name of this meme. And this is still just the beginning of the meme spread. It's impossible to say exactly how many people saw the video at the time, but some estimates say over 900 million people had seen the Star Wars Kid video by 2006. The video would become so popular it leaked from the internet and entered pop culture. Star Wars Kid was referenced in shows like American Dad, South Park, and Arrested Development, and was also featured in more unexpected places like in Tony Hawk's Underground 2. But eventually, as with all memes, the Star Wars Kid would die off in popularity. And when things simmered down, that's when people started asking the question, hey, you know this kid that we've been relentlessly bullying for like six years? I wonder what happened to him, I wonder how he's doing. This was a question that Andy Bio, the aforementioned blogger, had himself. And considering his relevance to the legacy of the Star Wars kid, you know, being the guy that kind of gave the name to the meme and spread it to millions of people, he made it his quest to track down this guy and try to interview him. Andy's quest would eventually lead him to getting into contact with one of the classmates that uploaded the video in the first place. Remember Jerome Laflamme and his two unnamed associates? Yeah, those guys. This classmate would explain to Andy how they got the video, how they found it on a school camcorder and uploaded it to the internet as a prank. They would confirm that they were classmates of the Star Wars kid and also told Andy that the Star Wars kid's name was Ghislaine Raza and they could get an interview with him. With the help of a French interpreter, Andy manages to set up an interview with Ghislaine to get the scoop on what the Star Wars kid thought of his viral fame. And surprisingly, in this interview, Ghislaine seems surprisingly chill about the whole affair, even saying that he kinda liked some of the remixes of his video. Though, if you read between the lines a bit, he does appear a little bit frustrated about certain elements. What's your opinion of these videos? From what I saw, they looked very well made. It's surprising to see what people have done with a video that wasn't meant to be seen. It's interesting. Did you know that over 500,000 people have viewed your video? Yes, I know. When you made the video, did you think this many people would be viewing it? No, I really never anticipated that. How did the video end up on the web? Actually, it was a mistake. The cassette was left in the studio and someone put it on the internet. In this interview, Ghislaine also expressed the desire to get an iPod at some point in the near future, which then gave Andy Bayow the idea to ask the internet's help in crowdfunding an iPod to gift to the Star Wars kid himself. And about a month later, this effort proved successful, with over 400 people donating to the cause, raising the Star Wars kid $4,334. Fun fact, Andy Bayow would later become the chief technical officer of Kickstarter. Anyhow, Ghislaine was soon sent the iPod crowdfunded by Andy along with a gift certificate for the remaining balance of the funds. Andy also left a touching note which read, In return for the countless hours of entertainment you've given us and the hardships you've had to face, please accept this 30 gigabyte iPod for your trouble. A very large gift certificate to Future Shop with the remainder of the funds in the mail. Remember, the internet loves you. May the force be with you always. So this seemed like it could have potentially been a turning point in regard to public opinion of just slaying the Star Wars kid. You know, hey, uh, he's kind of accepting the meme, let's send him an iPod, you know, this guy's pretty chill after all. But as Andy's note even mentioned, the guy went through a lot of shit. 
I mean, it's like, put yourself in the shoes of just laying here for a second. It's like, hey kid, thanks for the years of content. I, I hope we didn't ruin your life or anything. Here's an iPod for your troubles. Take care, bud. It just kind of really doesn't seem like uh, making amends for much of anything, if you ask me. In response to getting the iPod, Just Slane would respond via email to Andy, explaining that while he appreciated the gesture of being gifted the iPod, he wished the video had remained private from the start, clearly stating for the record that becoming a living meme had been an overall terrible experience for him. After all, the kid had lost friends over the video and was being bullied relentlessly at school. According to Ghislaine, classmates would climb on top of tables and mimic the moves he performed in the video in front of him. <laughs> that just sounds fucking terrible, Jesus Christ, I would punch somebody in the face. Ghislaine would be so mentally damaged by this viral disaster that he would eventually drop out of high school and was sent to a children's psychiatric ward to continue his education and receive indefinite treatment. With this in mind, it was obvious that uploading the kid's private video to the internet was a clear injustice and those responsible for the theft should likely be held accountable. In late July of 2003, in light of the depressing developments surrounding Star Wars kids' personal life, Ghislaine's parents filed a civil suit against the parents of the students who first leaked the private video to the internet, demanding over $250,000 in damages. This lawsuit would carry on for three years before eventually concluding out of court, with an unspecified amount of money changing hands between the families. Most on the internet had long moved on from Star Wars Kid at this point and didn't even realize these legal proceedings had happened. And fewer still knew about the hardships experienced by Ghislaine. Ghislaine would eventually leave the psychiatric facility and return to high school for his senior year. Upon graduation, the young man continued his education and received a law degree at McGill University in Montreal, and has reportedly garnered other accolades in his adult life. Despite his adolescence essentially being ruined by a viral video, Ghislaine managed to pick up the pieces and move on to better things. In May of 2013, just over 10 years after the original release of Star Wars Kid, Ghislaine would break his silence on the matter and give an interview for a Quebec magazine after seeing a trend of suicides online as a result of cyberbullying. Quote, you'll survive, you'll get through it, and you're not alone. You are surrounded by people who love you. And what was likely the first case of a living meme getting cyber bullied over a viral video, that was the story of the Star Wars kid. When an aspiring filmmaker makes a documentary exposing Ugandan war criminal Joseph Kony, a worldwide effort to stop the man takes over. The humanitarian meme Kony 2012 is born. However, Kony's creator never expected his video to get as big as it did, and this popular documentary wound up turning into a meme that inadvertently ruined the man's life. This is the story of Kony 2012. On March 5th of 2012, a YouTube video was uploaded titled Kony 2012. It was a documentary detailing the story of a Ugandan warlord named Joseph Kony. At the time, Kony was relatively unknown to most of the world, but in Uganda, he was a feared leader of a Christian-based terrorist group known as the Lord's Resistance Army, or LRA. The main goal of the faction was to overthrow the Ugandan government. The LRA and Joseph Kony were responsible for committing some of the most heinous crimes imaginable, from mass murder to employing child soldiers and employing child sex slaves. The creator of Kony 2012, Jason Russell, had in fact witnessed some of these atrocities firsthand during a research filmmaking trip he took to the area in 2003. Russell had been attempting to raise public awareness regarding Joseph Kony ever since, and had created many failed video campaigns in an effort to do so. But something about Kony 2012 was different. This documentary was the culmination of Jason Russell's life's work. Its purpose was twofold in that it wanted to raise public awareness regarding who Joseph Kony was and the atrocities that he's committed, and of course it wanted to raise a bunch of money to, I guess, stop Joseph Kony and 
help Ugandans. They were admittedly pretty vague in the documentary about exactly what they wanted to do, but that's the gist of the project. The end of the Kony 2012 YouTube video detailed ways viewers could help, which included signing a pledge of support and contributing money by way of the purchase of a $30 action kit. These action kits contained a Kony 2012 shirt and Kony posters. The selling point of the kits were linked to an event dubbed by the Kony creator as Cover the Night. The event plan being that on April 20th, 420, everyone who purchased action kits would go out at night and canvas, plastering Kony materials around their local area in mass protests of the warlord. This documentary was polished, at least in regard to YouTube standards, and the call to action against Kony resonated with those online. Kony 2012 would crack just over 75 million views in a week, and Invisible Children, the charity that Jason Russell had co-founded, would raise over $10 million in this short period of time. If you were an active internet user in 2012, you know just how inescapable the phrase Kony 2012 had become. The entire campaign to overthrow Joseph Kony essentially becoming one of the biggest internet memes in internet history. Kony 2012 was being discussed by YouTubers both big and small. The mainstream media was obsessing over the story, the entire world fixating and donating massive sums of money to stopping a dictator they didn't even know existed until about seven days prior. But as is the case with many stories that I discuss on this channel, the moment that a large sum of money gets involved, that's when some fuckery is afoot. Naturally, with the immense success of Kony 2012 and large sums of money now involved, folks began asking the question, um, all right, so, so we like raise all this money and yeah, like we hate Joseph Kony, but, but now what? What exactly was Invisible Children, more importantly, Jason Russell, going to do about Joseph Kony and his victims? With no clear immediate action being taken by the organization, skeptics would become vocal, and a certain sect of the internet actively began prying into the affairs of Russell and his charity. The first blemish, donation ratios. After doing a bit of digging, critics discovered prior year financial statements from the Invisible Children charity. These documents revealed that only 32% of the organization's expenditures went towards direct humanitarian services, while the lion's share of 68% went back into the operating costs of the charity. With almost everyone assuming that all of the donated money was going towards toppling Kony, you can imagine some people were pissed off about that. Additionally, some would unearth old photos of Jason Russell wherein he's flexing with guns in Uganda, and they shared these photos citing the images as an indication that Russell was more of an unprofessional grifter than a humanitarian hero. Others found embarrassing old videos created by Russell, apparently coming from prior failed efforts at starting a viral Coney campaign. your mind it needs attention and a dance to make it sparkle and shine Financials and unprofessionalism aside, some simply just had issue with the entire premise of the campaign and felt that Russell had focused far too much on Joseph Coney in the documentary and didn't talk about the victims enough, essentially claiming that the documentary didn't help anyone's situation and only made Joseph Coney a celebrity in the West. Turned people's problems into their businesses. And uh, it's unfortunate that we can have people who are merchandising but using people's problems. This scrutiny began to snowball and narrative cracks would begin to form in regard to the documentary itself. One such error was the fact that despite the documentary presenting Joseph Kony as this current scourge of Uganda, in all reality, Kony was no longer in the country and hadn't been there for years. It almost seemed as if Russell purposely omitted the truth about Coney's location and activities to strengthen the narrative of his story and attach his cause to Uganda's ongoing humanitarian crisis. So it was like the more you looked into Jason Russell and the Coney 2012 documentary and the fundraiser, it's like the less anything made sense. 
What the hell was the actual purpose of this documentary? Like, why are we raising money? What's going on here? The entire Coney 2012 project revealed itself to be lazy and unfocused in regard to its goals, and media outlets began to accuse Russell and his organization of being slacktivists, or opportunistic grifters who attached themselves to a humanitarian cause in an effort to attain fame, money, and notoriety. As the creator of the film and face of the Coney 2012 movement, Jason Russell would become inundated with criticisms. His phone was ringing off the hook with media outlets from across the country attempting to book interviews with the man and question him regarding the charity's next step. And for a while, Jason Russell attempted to placate the masses attending these interviews day after day. For weeks, Jason Russell spent his time traveling across the United States attending interviews spending practically every waking moment of his life dealing with the unfolding controversy surrounding the Coney 2012 movement he personally created. The man got little sleep and was under immense stress. The media and public pressure exerted upon Jason would eventually become so unmanageable that the man essentially broke and Jason Russell's psyche unraveled in a public display that would become one of the most bizarre mental breakdowns caught on camera in history. TMZ would publish disturbing amateur footage, the recording showing Jason Russell completely naked in public, yelling at the top of his lungs while aimlessly roaming around at a San Diego street corner. Russell had completely lost his mind. The pressure of maintaining the disaster that Coney 2012 had become whittling his psyche down to a dysfunctional state. Concerned bystanders would notify police and Jason would be detained and hospitalized not long after. While receiving medical care, Jason reportedly attempted to escape the facility and expressed that doctors were trying to kill him. According to Jason's family, he was diagnosed with brief reactive psychosis, an acute state brought on by extreme exhaustion, stress, and dehydration. Jason would receive extensive treatment and after some well-needed rest, his mental state returned to normal approximately two weeks after his embarrassing public freakout. The video showcasing Jason hitting rock bottom of his downward spiral was published to YouTube and the video would go on to amass millions of views. And with this thing now floating around, any goodwill that was out there towards Jason Russell and invisible children had practically evaporated. The TMZ video proved to be the kill shot of Coney 2012. While some devout Coney 2012ers would participate in the April 20th Cover the Night event in their local communities, the campaign had for all intents and purposes imploded. Some of Invisible Children's co-founders attempted to keep the sinking ship afloat with public appearances and reassurances that Coney would be stopped, but by this point the charity was considered nothing more than a joke, with Jason Russell and his nude mental breakdown being the punchline. Aftermath Today, Invisible Children has all but disbanded. In regard to the money raised during the Coney 2012 campaign, well, despite the misleading documentary, the campaign was never determined to be fraudulent, and the money raised found its way to a series of small Ugandan charity projects. So at least money ended up in Uganda. I guess that's a W, right? And in case you were wondering, no, they didn't stop Joseph Coney. In fact, the man is still alive, but... His health is on the downslope, so who knows how long he'll be around. And as for Jason himself, he would leave Invisible Children, but continues his activism in other ways to this day. It's impossible to say how much this affected him in the long term. I mean, at least there hasn't been any more public breakdowns. I'd be willing to say Jason Russell learned his lesson in regard to biting off more than you can chew in regard to uh, fundraising projects. I find it hard to come away from this story really hating Jason Russell as I don't really think he was a malicious actor. I, I just think he was a guy that really punched above his weight class and like I said, bit off more than he can chew. But anyways, that's the story of Jason Russell in the Coney 2012 flop. Many of you are likely familiar with the Techno Viking. One of the first viral memes in YouTube history, this muscle-bound chad of a human being and his signature dance moves have been viewed by hundreds of millions of internet users in the nearly two decades of the clip existing online. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the Techno Viking wasn't at all happy about being made into a living meme and actually attempted to sue the man responsible for recording him. A meme that negatively impacted practically everyone involved with its creation, this is the story of the Techno Viking. 
Our story begins all the way back in July of the year 2000 with German media art student Matthias Fritsch. Fritsch was in the process of creating a series of experimental short films and recorded many public events and gatherings around Germany during this time. One such event documented by Fritsch was Fuck Parade 2000 held in Berlin, Germany. Fuck Parade is an annual grassroots demonstration held in the city to celebrate music and arts while simultaneously protesting commercialism. Essentially like Woodstock, but in a city and it's like a loosely organized parade of sorts. Matthias Fritsch would capture a great deal of footage on this day, but the most notable recording involved this particular scene which begins with a blue-haired girl dancing to techno music. In this now iconic shot, the dancing girl appears to be grabbed by a disorderly man in the crowd. Moments later, a muscular, bearded individual, seeing this inappropriate contact, intervenes. The bearded man goes on to separate the offender from the girl and keeps the guy in his grip for a few seconds, apparently issuing some sort of verbal warning to the rabble rouser, and then the disruptive parade attendee dejectedly walks away. This series of events by themselves is already a great catch by Fritsch, but what happens next makes the footage legendary. After the conclusion of the fuck parade, Fritsch would go home and upload several clips he recorded at the event to his website, subrealic.net. One of the clips uploaded was the altercation involving the muscle-bound dancer. Fritsch would title this recording, Knee Cam Number 1. Matthias would go on to show footage obtained at the fuck parade at film festival events around the time. The distinct Viking-like appearance of the video's protagonist and the overall absurdity of events displayed in the footage certainly made for a compelling viewing experience. But considering the inaccessible nature of early internet video, few would actually see knee cam when it was published, and the video would essentially sit in a state of online purgatory for the next few years. But then a site called YouTube comes along. In 2006, Matthias Friss creates a YouTube channel for his subrealic content, and in October, he uploads a copy of Kneecam No. 1 to his channel. This upload receives little attention at first, but strangely enough goes viral in September of 2007 after the clip is discovered and reposted by a Central American porn website called Petardis.com. Nikam's YouTube views began to skyrocket after the video had been shared, and in the comments section you would see a lot of commentary regarding the video's Viking-like protagonist. As with many living memes on the internet, folks are quick to assign a catchy shorthand nickname to any figure involved in a viral video, and the name that commenters unanimously seem to agree on for this individual was of course the Techno Viking. In 2007, Techno Viking would become an inescapable online presence. The man became a phenomena with fans of the meme and video uploading recreations of the dance and parodying the video in a variety of ways. The internet built up the legend of the Techno Viking as this righteous and mighty figure, an individual that strikes fear into the hearts of fuck parade girl grabbers and stuns all with his impressive dance moves. He was beloved by all online. And needless to say, the popularity of the Techno Viking was a good thing for the guy who recorded the video, Matthias Fritsch, essentially the creator of the meme. Fritsch's Techno Viking video saw such popularity that he was offered an AdSense deal with Google, with the company reportedly directly reaching out to him sometime in 2008. According to reports, this AdSense money was enough that Fritsch was able to essentially live off of the video for some time. In an effort to capitalize off the video's success even further, Fritsch would create and sell a wide variety of t-shirts featuring the Techno Vikings likeness. These shirts were advertised in the video's description box. Through ads, merchandising, and two TV licenses, Fritsch managed to rake in close to $15,000 in the months following the viral explosion of the Viking. And for any small-time independent video creator, this was a dream come true. Fritsch was able to monetize something he recorded and basically live off of his own work. 
the meme he had inadvertently created being beloved and being watched daily by millions of people. It was beginning to look like Matthias might be able to convert this techno viking thing into a long term career of sorts. But just as things begin to get good for Matthias Fritsch, that's when he's hit with a life changing reality check. That reality check coming in the form of a cease and desist letter in his mailbox. In December of 2009, Matthias Fritsch was sent a letter from a lawyer representing the techno viking himself. The viking, who remained anonymous, was demanding Fritsch remove all content featuring his likeness from the internet including the famous video and any merchandise associated with it. A segment from the cease and desist reads as follows. My client has hired us to take care of his legal interests. We have to point out that the use of our client's image, especially for commercial reasons, is a violation of his personality rights, especially the right to images of one's likeness. So apparently the man behind the techno viking had issue with this online silliness surrounding his image and also didn't care for the fact that Matthias was making money off of this thing. Fritsch would issue a measured response to this cease and desist letter. Cognizant of the internet's unanimous affection for the Viking, he attempted to reason with the man and even offered to work together to monetize the Viking video in a way that would be beneficial for both him and the disgruntled man. You know, Matthias was likely thinking, dude, the internet loves you, like this isn't a bad thing, there's a way that we can make this a mutually good thing for the both of us. However, the Viking nor his lawyer never took up this proposition, and as a result of the threat, Fritz found it prudent to remove all merchandise associated with the Techno Viking from his social media. He also turned off the monetization of the Techno Viking video. He would keep the video up, but placed a large annotation over the content which blocked the visuals, the annotation informing viewers that ongoing legal issues surrounded the Techno Viking video. Matthias was taking the matter seriously and appeared to respect the wishes of the techno viking even if he may not have agreed with the guy's analysis of the situation. Hast du darauf reagiert zunächst? Ich habe ihm als erstes einen äh, Brief geschrieben im Gedanken, dass dass es super ist, äh, dass er sich jetzt endlich meldet, dass wir eine Möglichkeit haben miteinander zu reden. Ähm habe ihm auch versichert, dass es mir jetzt nicht daran liegt, da äh, seine Rechte zu äh, verletzen. Ich habe ihm auch angeboten, da wir ja jetzt miteinander kommunizieren können, kann man ja auch drüber nachdenken, diese Berühmtheit der Kunstfigur, die da entstanden ist, ähm, vielleicht wirklich lohnenswert zu vermeiden. But despite Matthias Fritsch's compliance, the techno viking and his lawyers wanted the man to pay for using the anonymous individual's likeness, even if Matthias Fritsch made this guy an internet legend. In January of 2013, it was revealed that the anonymous techno viking had officially filed a lawsuit against Fritsch under the grounds of violating his privacy, damaging his character, and profiting off of his image without necessary permission or compensation. The Vikings lawyers were demanding Fritsch to pay at least 40,000 euros for the damages. The anonymous man's team would present a case that not only attempted to hold Fritsch accountable for publishing the original video, but also attempted to make Fritsch responsible for the thousands of re-uploads that had populated YouTube around the time. It's also been reported that an additional 10,000 euros were requested for the Viking because of quote, pain and suffering unquote, that he suffered due to the video's spread. After a series of trials in the early months of 2013, the case concluded on June 11th, with the judge ruling in favor of the techno viking and asserting that his personality rights had indeed been violated. Matthias Fritz was required to pay all royalties he generated from the video's ads and merchandise sales in addition to a majority share of the court costs. The pain and suffering request was thrown out, however. As a result of this lawsuit, Matthias Fritz owed a lot of money and could no longer publish any imagery showing the techno viking unless it was obscured to the point where you couldn't even tell it was the guy. And it's important to note that this court order only applied to Matthias Fritsch. It didn't affect any of the re-uploads that were out there uploaded by the thousands of other random people on the internet. If the lawsuit's intention was to stop the spread of the techno viking meme, it failed miserably. But what it didn't fail at was transplanting about 15,000 euros of Matthias Fritsch's money into the pocket of the techno viking and his lawyers. The loss of this income essentially ruining Fritsch's life for a period of time and putting him on the verge of bankruptcy. During the trial, techno viking's lawyers claimed that techno was getting unwanted approaches by right wing groups and lost jobs as a result of the meme. 
so yeah, I mean, I guess that does kind of suck, right? Nobody wants to lose their job over a meme. Whatever the case, becoming a meme didn't set well with the techno viking and he especially didn't like that Matthias Fritsch was making money off of it. Probably one of the most bizarre elements of this story is that even after a lawsuit, the identity of the techno viking is still unknown to this day. As with the case being about personality rights and privacy, the techno viking's name was never publicly revealed. Only the people involved in that trial know the man's identity, including Matthias Fritsch, and it's safe to say that Fritsch won't be revealed revealing that name for obvious reasons. Over the years, many have made false claims of being the techno viking with articles citing a plethora of bearded gentlemen as candidates for the viking's identity. All such claims have been debunked and the man's identity remains a mystery to this day. A viral video that cursed both the living meme figure in it and its creator, that was the story of the techno viking. When a Taiwanese model's photograph is used to make an internet meme, what follows is a series of events that end up permanently damaging the woman's life and her career prospects. This is the story of the plastic surgery hoax. To begin, we need to become familiar with an old internet story that was being reported almost 20 years ago. In June of 2004, a bizarre news article was published online claiming that a Chinese man known as Jian Feng divorced his wife after he suspected that she cheated on him. And what was his reasoning for having this suspicion? Well, it was because his pregnant wife gave birth to ugly babies. And apparently the man, feeling as if he was a good looking guy and thought he had a beautiful wife, he thought this to be impossible. The only explanation was that his wife had cheated on him. But the story purports that a DNA test later confirmed that the baby was actually his and that the woman didn't cheat. So the man is confused, you know, how is it possible that we have these ugly babies? Well, the story claims that eventually the wife would confess to the husband that she had thousands of dollars of plastic surgery done before the two had gotten together. Absurdly enough, this story goes on to purport that the man was later able to sue his ex-wife for $120,000 in damages for apparently deceiving him with her artificial looks. Now, I think it goes without saying that the validity of this story is extremely questionable. It may or may not have happened, <laughs> but just, just know that it existed and let's bookmark this story and fast forward to 2012. In 2012, a Taiwanese model by the name of Heidi Ye was hired to participate in a photo shoot. Photos taken from this were going to be integrated into an advertisement for a plastic surgery clinic in the city of Taipei. The ad was intended to be humorous and it took the form of a family photo, with members of the family being portrayed by Heidi and other actors. In post-production, edits were applied to the image to give the children featured an unsightly appearance, each sporting small eyes and flat noses while the adults in the image were left normal. The suggestion here being that the adults had had plastic surgery but that couldn't hide their, you know, bad genetics, hence the ugly babies or whatever. It's admittedly a strange angle for an ad to take but the joke is pretty obvious. The caption associated with this print ad translated to English read, the only thing you have to worry about after plastic surgery is the explaining you'll have to do to your children. So what does that 2004 Chinese couple divorce story have to do with this plastic surgery ad. Well, on October 31st of 2013, the Irish Examiner wrote an article discussing the 2004 story and included a supposed picture of the mother in question and her before and after images after receiving plastic surgery. This prompted the old story to go minorly viral again and other outlets would discuss it. However, when publications attempted to dig up and expand upon the reporting, that's when trouble arose, as some would begin erroneously associating the old Chinese divorce story with high Heidi Ye's Taiwanese plastic surgery ad, misidentifying the woman as the Chinese wife featured in the infamous report. The result of this was a popular meme format which showed Heidi's photo shoot with the text below stating plastic surgery, you can't hide it forever. Additionally, this image began to go viral on Facebook and it almost always was attached with that bogus Chinese story. 
People online were mocking Heidi and the other actors featured in the image under the false pretense of them being the family featured in the old tall tale. Eventually, Heidi herself would catch wind of the development. She had heard about the confusion early on from a friend and could only watch in horror as lies about her spread around the world. People in Taiwan had become aware of her story and the meme started to negatively affect her personal life and modeling career prospects. Prior to all of this, Heidi had gotten major modeling roles and commercials for large brands such as KFC and also was hired to promote many Japanese beauty products. However, after the meme featuring her and the bogus story started to spread, the woman struggled to lock down even minor gigs. In an interview with the BBC, she would describe hardships faced during this time. When I first heard about this from a friend, I thought it was just a one-off rumor. Then I realized the whole world was spreading it and in different languages. People actually thought it was real. Even my then boyfriend's friends would ask about it. People refused to believe that I had never had plastic surgery. Clients would ask me if I was the woman in the picture. After this, I only got small roles in advertisements. The model stated that the spread of the meme left her crying constantly and needing to change professions. These claims would later be echoed by an attorney hired by the woman, who was representing her in an effort to sue the plastic surgery clinic and advertising agency responsible for the image, stating that the usage of the images violated the copyright agreement specified in her contract. And Heidi claims that she didn't know that this plastic surgery advertisement would be posted to the internet. She thought it was a print-only ad. A representative from the ad agency stated that both their use and the clinic's use of the image had been fully legal and that the defamatory actions had been perpetrated by others online. Quote, As we all know, no one controls the internet. We can't anticipate what degree of an impact it will have, how people will view it, and what they will do with it. These legal threats from Heidi resulted in both companies threatening to sue her back for claiming that they were responsible for the wrongdoing. A lawsuit regarding this incident would begin in 2015. Details of how that went are unclear. Whatever the case, it's clear this meme caused irreparable damage to this woman's life. Moral of the story here, guys, is make sure you're not just blindly reposting wild stories you find on the internet, because you just may be actively participating in a mass defamation campaign against a completely innocent person. One of the most infamous early internet viral videos is that of the angry German kid, aka Keyboard Crasher. It's a classic video, apparently showcasing a clearly disturbed youth experiencing a bit of gamer rage. And for decades, the kid featured in the video was a target of mockery, derision, and relentless memory. However, what few fail to realize is that this was actually intended to be a satirical skit. And when the context of this video being a joke was stripped from the video, the internet mocked the kid so much he became a living meme, a designation that essentially would ruin his life. This is the story of the angry German kid. In 2005, a German teenager by the name of Norman Koshinowski decided to start creating online video after receiving a video camera for his 13th birthday. This was in the days before YouTube and Norman would upload these videos to a German video hosting website known as Hodenmumps.net. Norman's online career began with a video titled Real Gangster. This video would set the tone for Norman's satirical presence. It was essentially a skit featuring a character Norman had created known as Leopold Slick. Leopold Slick as a character was created as a way to satirize goofy white kids on the internet that tried to act tough by putting on a sort of stereotypical gangster persona. I'm a real gangster. I listen to music with bad words. I'm a real gangster. I listen to techno. I'm a real gangster. I'm burning CDs. I'm a real gangster. I watch movies with blood. Norman's Leopold Slick character would become popular on Hoden Mumps, and he sort of became a minor e-celebrity in Germany before that was even a thing. Seeing the success of his initial video, he continued to pump out videos in the Leopold Slick character and expanded to make more live-action sketches as well. <laughs> Ooh. 
Norman's online videos became somewhat of a phenomenon within Germany, but outside of the country, his viewership was virtually non-existent. But that would eventually change thanks to a video created by Norman called PC Spielen, or translated to English, PC Play. PC Spielen, like all of Norman's work, was a satire piece. The video itself intended to make fun of gaming-addicted kids raging over minor inconveniences in video games. Ich sag's nicht noch einmal! Los! Like all the rest of the Leopold Slick content, this was satire, it was staged, the guy wasn't actually like this, he's playing a character. And anyone who is a Leopold Slick fan and saw this video on Hoden Mumps would have realized that. But unfortunately for Norman, this uh, very convincing satire sort of runs into issues when it's presented without any sort of context. The trolling on display here was so good it was difficult to detect unless you were tuned in to the guy's stuff. Sometime shortly after the release of Norman's satirical PC Play video, a German TV production company by the name of Focus TV was in the process of creating a documentary covering the recent Emsdetten school shooting that took place in Germany in November of 2006. The perpetrator of this shooting was a man named Sebastian Boss, a man authorities claimed was heavily addicted to FPS shooters, Counter-Strike to be specific. This tidbit of information led to a prevailing theory amongst Germans that gaming addicted teenagers were being brainwashed by the games they played to become violent and shoot up schools. And this theory was what the Focus TV documentary was exploring. So what does any of this have to do with Norman Kochanowski? Well, in Focus TV's documentary, they actually featured Norman's PC Play video in their film and presented it as a genuine example of a psychologically disturbed gamer in the wild. Focus TV even refers to Norman by his fake name Leopold and assigns to him a phony backstory alleging that the video was secretly recorded by Leopold's father in an effort to capture proof of his son's apparent violent behavior. Vor eben diesem Jungen kursiert ein Video im Internet. Sein Name? Leopold. Die Aufnahmen hat sein Vater angeblich heimlich gemacht. Das Problem? Leopold kommt bei seinem Lieblingsballerspiel nicht online. But with context, we know that this was actually a satirical skit recorded by Norman on his own volition. And ironically, this skit was directly mocking the individuals that this documentary was attempting to expose. Unfortunately for Norman, Focus TV's documentary would be viewed by millions around Germany, the piece essentially slandering Norman for a decent portion of its runtime. In the wake of Focus TV's piece, many keen news outlets caught what Focus TV didn't and pointed out the mistake, and Norman himself would make many responses regarding the apparent Focus TV slander, both in text and video. I am not sick or mad. I only have a sense of humor not everyone immediately understands. In addition, I have acting talent. I can do something so real that many think it's real. For this reason, I will be insulted by many and hated. The aim of my videos or movies is to entertain people, not provoke. Nobody should take my short videos on the internet seriously. They are merely for entertainment. No matter what people think or say, I am a very normal boy with acting talent. And here's a clip of Norman explaining that the videos are satire. Freunde, eins will ich euch noch mit auf den Weg geben. Nehmt diese Videos nicht ernst. Sie sind nur dargestellt, schaugespielt, versteht ihr? Sie sind nicht echt. In lieu of Focus TV's mistake, they would eventually pull the documentary from distribution, but by then the damage had already been done. Most people who had been exposed to it via the German mainstream media were now under the impression that it was a real example of violent teens influenced by video games, and they thought Leopold, aka Norman, was some sort of gaming-addicted psycho that needed to be investigated. 
And to make matters worse, around this time, re-uploads of the videos started going viral in the United States. So now you had a language barrier only compounding the problem of context getting lost in translation. The joke is completely lost, and now the entire world is thinking that Leopold is some deranged psychopath that needs to be institutionalized immediately. Comment sections begin referring to Leopold as the angry German kid, and baseless rumors begin spreading suggesting that the kid was sent to a psych ward or thrown in jail because of his shocking video. As for Norman, the online attention surrounding him didn't go unnoticed by those who knew him in real life, and around the time of this fiasco, he was bullied relentlessly by his classmates. According to reports, kids would pull out their cell phones and try to take pictures of him without permission, and many shouted lines from the videos at him as he walked around campus. The satirical videos that Norman created had inadvertently turned his life into a living hell. And as a result of the digital disaster that had unfolded surrounding his online character in late 2007, Norman would completely disappear from the internet, and updates regarding his personal life ceased. Leopold Slick was no more. The young man essentially having no choice but to forfeit his likeness to the internet masses and go into hiding. The mockery would persist for years, but as with any viral video slash meme, eventually things begin to die down and people become disinterested. And by the early 2010s, this had essentially become a dead meme. Around the time of the meme going stale, that's when you had people, you know, sort of scratching their heads thinking, uh, Hey, you remember the, you know, that, that angry German kid that we've been like bullying for the last half decade? I wonder what happened to him and how our mockery affected his life. The answer to this question proved to be elusive, with efforts to dig up information about what happened to the kid failing time and time again. However, fortunately for those invested in the fate of the angry German kid, they'd get a massive update in 2017. In October of 2017, the then 26-year-old Norman Kochanowski finally revealed himself to the internet under his new YouTube channel, Hercules AGK. And a lot had changed in the 10 years since PC Play's release. Norman was now jacked and had essentially become a Giga Chad making many videos about fitness, weightlifting, and showcasing hip-hop music that he had created. But most important to this story is a video that Norman uploaded basically explaining the entire narrative and storyline of his life as the angry German kid. The start of the video's viral hype, all the way to him getting bullied at school, it sort of ruining his life, and so on and so forth. Norman says that the meme inadvertently resulted in him getting kicked out of school and missing out on job opportunities, but he was eventually able to pull his life together after getting a girlfriend. I'll allow Norman himself to explain what happened. Hello, my international friends. As you know, I made this video, Angry German Kid, where I freak out and smash my keyboard, which uh, went all over the world and I was famous about this. Everyone in school know, uh, knew me and after a year or a little bit longer I got nuts. You know, I got enough of this shit and I quit being the Unreal Tournament kid. I uh, dyed my hair black, I uh, threw my glasses away and wear contact lenses <clears throat> so nobody could recognize me. So this wasn't enough. I grew older, I was 17, then it was uh, three years of daily attention of daily psychic terror. I wanted, I wanted people to be afraid of me. Because when they are afraid of me, they don't make fun of me. Hey, real gangster, hey. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, one day I got insane, yeah? I went crazy one day. It was a class trip and uh, I drank something too much. And then I started talking to my classmates. How I hate all people, how I hate this fucking world. And, uh, one, and one day, I take my Kalashnikov, put it in my, in my trunk, and uh, one morning there will be a great shooting and all motherfuckers will die and there will be no angry German kid anymore. No one will shout at me. Yeah, that, that's what I said. I quickly googled a picture of, uh, of a Kalashnikov and uh, showed it to my classmates. Here, that's what I got at home. Nice, huh? It's nice what you can all get from the darkness, you know? Mm -hmm. One classmate sat behind me and recorded everything with his phone. The teacher wanted to to calm down the situation, yeah, and maybe protect me because I was drunk and young and dumb and, well, you know. But it was too late. And then the police came, took me back 
to police station. So my parents picked me up. I was uh, kicked out of school. I got a penalty, but luckily I could finish my school on another school. Well, then I came in jail for, I don't know, one month, but uh, just because I don't want to make hours of community service and I don't have money to pay, but fine. So jail. Then I came out after this ridiculous time. I came out and was looking for an apprenticeship or a job. And I don't get a job. Everywhere where I, uh, where I wanted to work, they recognized me as uh, the insane maniac of the school or the angry German kids. Yeah, and for two years, I couldn't find a job. So I isolated myself from the world. I hated the world and were, were two years only training, training, training. That's why I became so big. After two years, I tried again, tried again to look for work, an apprenticeship, whatever. And then finally, I got an apprenticeship. And that was the year where my life became great from a horror life which was not worth living to a great life i found a new uh, group of people which which i go uh, partying every weekend we go every weekend to the club and then i got a girlfriend a new car suddenly suddenly everything was great i got suddenly i got friends suddenly i got a job a girlfriend a new car which was really nice that's it that was my life since these videos and now you know. If you didn't know, now you know. Yeah. Norman really was dealt a shit hand. I mean, most living memes become infamous because they just are inherently cringe. The guy was actually a talented satirist and actor, but he was just taken out of context, language barriers and all that. It caused people to get the wrong impression of him and he was bullied relentlessly for people thinking he was actually crazy when he was just a good actor. That being said though, it is pleasing to see that Norman has accepted the meme in recent years and seems to be doing well in life. If you guys want to subscribe to his YouTube channel, I'll put that down in the description box. But that was the story of the angry German kid. Well that my friends was when memes ruin lives. Let me know what you guys thought about this video down below in the comments section and let me know who or what you want me to talk about next. I want to give a major shout out to my patrons. I appreciate you guys. Wavy Web Surf out. Peace.